one uh, predictable side effect of all of this um, discussion, debate, unrest, protests, riots that have been going on around the George Floyd issue has been how powerful regimes that are hostile to the West, not just to the United States, but the West in general, will absolutely be exploiting what is happening. Uh, I think there's no question about that. Um, and we've seen it from RT, which is predictable. That's what they've always done. RT has always had an anti-West agenda. But uh, we've also seen it now increasingly from Chinese state media. And I just want to voice out why I feel this is rank hypocrisy and why the West should take no lectures whatsoever from China. Um, firstly, just a disclaimer here. I'm not saying that the issues around George Floyd and police brutality and so on shouldn't be important and shouldn't be discussed. Of course they should. But everyone's talking about it right now. It's it's not censored. It's not off the table. It's absolutely in the fore of political discourse right now. Um, and that in itself is a fundamental difference between Western democracies, flawed as they are, and the Chinese model. In China, where is the public discussion in the mainland about an event such as the Tiananmen Square Massacre? It's true that that is commemorated every year in Hong Kong. This year there was restrictions ostensibly due to COVID, but probably because the Lam administration didn't want to um, have a demonstration that would, as her government sees it, offend China. Um, so yes, that does happen every year in Hong Kong, but it doesn't happen in the mainland. Many young Chinese are growing up totally oblivious to the events of 1989. Now, my position has always been, if, um, if the Chinese regime has nothing to hide, why are they so concerned about it being in the public domain? It's cowardly. This is something Chinese nationalists cannot answer. If, for example, they were merely putting down unrest or riots, which is the, the only rare occasion that they do talk about it, that is the narrative. Okay, why not just make that publicly available so the Chinese people can see that? But they won't do that. And I, I personally think they're hoping the passage of time people will just forget it. And they know that young generations are growing up. Um, they're being absolutely spoon-fed communist propaganda in their textbooks. I've personally seen it. Um, so the Chinese state is fundamentally, fundamentally dishonest in terms of introspection. But what have they been doing? They've been pointing out the human rights of George Floyd and the racism in America, as if the Chinese Communist Party gives a damn about human rights. As for the racism issue, America has its problems, no question about it. But China doesn't actually have a squeaky clean record. It may not be the case that Chinese police are having um, situations where they have officers putting their knees on black men. But if you look at the city of Guangzhou, there is a sizable Nigerian population there, mostly male workers. Now, they have reported an increasing number of openly racist incidents where Chinese people have been actually holding their noses as they walk past them. As, like, as with a lot of Asian countries, there is a perception that dark skin is somehow dirty or bad. Um, I've seen this attitude directly. Um, it's not that Chinese people, and certainly not generalised, but it's not that they will necessarily openly use a racially derogative term to a black person. And of course, not every Chinese person has this mentality, but it is prevalent. So they can't even lecture the West when it comes to racism because Racism is very much there in Chinese and, by the way, Indian societies. But they, it, when this is brought up, it tends to be dismissed as, oh, well, those people are just a little bit ignorant or they're a little bit rude. It's not racist. It is racist, actually. I've seen it. Um, and associating an entire ethnic group with being unclean or dirty is um, it's a racist mentality. Um, there's also been an increasing number of tensions on the African continent. You know, China has liked to kind of present itself as the alternative to the colonialist Europeans. Yet, it's pretty clear that China's 
mainly motivated by self-interest when it comes to Africa, as were European powers. But, you know, again, what we've been seeing in Africa is a growing number of tensions between locals and Chinese companies. Um, but let's just look at, focus more on China for a minute here. Because I just find it very galling that the Chinese state has the arrogance and the audacity to point fingers at the West. The Chinese Education Bureau, or excuse me, the Chinese Culture and Tourism Bureau Ministry has recently warned its citizens not to go to racist Australia. Now, due to COVID, there has unfortunately been some racist incidents against people of East Asian descent. That's irrefutable. It has happened and it's wrong. But what the Chinese Culture Ministry failed to recognise was that overseas Chinese students have also been engaging in plenty of bullying and intimidation themselves, particularly against Hong Kongers, but also against uh, white Westerners who have joined in protests against China's behaviour. An example of this was, I believe, at the University of Queensland. I, I think that was the institution, I'm not 100% recall off the top of my head but it was an Australian university and there was a solidarity demonstration for the situation in Hong Kong some mainland students actively grabbed the placard and um, pushed some of the students involved in that so we are seeing these 50 cent Chinese students behaving obnoxiously in other countries um, you know when they are in Britain or Australia or the United States or Canada or France They'll wave their national flags. Um, yet protests in China is pretty much forbidden. So it's fundamentally hypocritical. They we are going to protest in your countries because we can, and we're going to denounce you as racist and talk about how awful your society is and how it disrespects China. Um, but they can't protest domestically about anything, pretty much. Um, you know, you try looking at a situation where protest is allowed in mainland China, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and this is not because of the narrative the Communist Party wants to put out that it's a harmonious society. Actually, there are a lot of bubbling issues beneath the surface, but a whole range of things, particularly over land um, issues when the central government moved in and wants to um get into a new construction project sometimes this is over ancestral cemeteries sometimes it's about forced relocation of locals um so this narrative that the communist state likes to put out to the world oh this is communist stability it's a false narrative china is not as stable a society as the communist party would like people to believe so they're putting out this message oh look at america it's burning right America has deep problems, no question about it. And I personally think that America does have to look at itself. There is serious, um, serious problems going on there, not just with racial issues. I believe actually healthcare is another major, major thing that needs to be candidly looked at there. But here's the fundamental difference between the United States and China or Canada and China or Britain and China or Australia and China. And it can actually be quite simplified. It's freedom of expression. Freedom of expression. In Western societies, people can openly, openly denounce the government as terrible, as racist, as authoritarian. They can openly protest. They cannot riot and loot and engage in criminal behaviour because every society has laws for stability. But you contrast that basic aspect between China and the West, and tell me what society is more tolerant. I mean, the Meng Wanzhou case, um, the woman uh, who is the daughter of a senior Huawei official, she is a senior official herself, who's currently uh, detained in Vancouver with proceedings ongoing over alleged corruption. Look at the situation that she has compared to the Canadians currently being held hostage, as far as I'm concerned, are being held hostage in China. She has full access to her legal rights. She has access to a lawyer. She has a due process. And she even has her little protesters, Chinese nationals who are out there talking about how China is being picked on. 
um, contrasts to the two Canadians, the two Michaels, uh, accused of spying, yet they haven't had a day in court, haven't had any access to lawyers, they haven't had any due process. They're basically um, lying in Chinese jails without any information. I can't imagine what their families are going through. That's how the Chinese regime treats foreigners. It deems to be falling foul of Chinese security. Um, but look at that fundamental difference in terms of legal transparency and due process. So I really don't think the we, the West, I'm talking in a collective term, because this affects all all three countries, not just in the West, anywhere in the world, actually. Um, all open and transparent countries need to really be aware of Chinese behaviour. The arrogance, the sheer arrogance that they have to play the victim is pathetic. Yes, there has been racist incidents against Chinese nationals, but you know what? The police will investigate those crimes. They will arrest the people responsible. They will be charged potentially with hate crime. It's not a case that the West is turning a blind eye to those sort of incidents. China, on the other hand, actively doesn't just turn a blind eye to what the 50 Cent Army, which is a sort of colloquial term for um, these idealistic, nationalistic student to cause trouble in Western universities. Not only does the Chinese state ignore that, they actively encourage it. So for all our claims about stay out of our internal affairs, it could be strongly argued that China has actually been meddling in the West for years by stoking up its diaspora, by trying to undermine our democracy, by using the principles of our democracy against us. And I say um, it's time we stand up to them. Um, the proposals to offer BNO passport holders um, asylum in Britain uh, has been met by an arrogant rebuke by Xi Jinping. Winnie the Pooh himself has um, threatened Britain uh, that there will be consequences if we go ahead with this. As far as I'm concerned, that's all the more reason for us to push it. We really, really need to see the Chinese regime for what it is. A lying, fair authoritarian, cardly, um, single party regime. That is what it is. The only thing the Chinese state cares about is power. They don't give a damn about human rights. And for them to use the situation with George Floyd to try and point score and say, oh, well, look, America is this, that and the other. Um, they're in no position to do it. Now, does America have a perfect human rights record? No, it doesn't. And Americans do need to be honest about that. Um, so perhaps one could argue Americans need to be careful when it lectures other countries about human rights. Its own human rights record is far from ideal. It's record in race relations is obviously far from ideal. Um, the, the rate of incarceration in the United States, the lack of access to health care, uh, poverty, those are all earning issues. But China, of all states, has absolutely no high ground whatsoever to be pointing fingers at the United States so long as there is no open discussion in China against the Communist Party. You know, filmmakers in China, when they make a film that is critical of certain aspects of history, they find themselves uh, on a long waiting line before the film can get released. And when it is released, if it is released, it is subject to heavy censorship. That's been the case with a lot of Zhang Yimou's early films. I just think the West needs to really, really take a hard line against Chinese jingoism, actually, because the sheer vitriol the sheer um, xenophobic rants that we've been seeing from the likes of Global Times. China demands respect, but when you look at the way it talks about other countries, when you look at the way it talks about foreigners, actually, it's incredibly jingoistic. So we should absolutely ignore their demands for respect until they give some reason to be respected. You know, China needs to understand that respect is earned. They can't just throw the weight around the world and demand respect when they're acting like thugs. And by they, I'm talking about the Chinese state, I'm not talking about ordinary Chinese. Nevertheless, it is irrefutable that the Chinese state is stoking up its diaspora. So right now, all the focus is on um, Black Lives Matter and the protests that are going on. Fine, we can have that discussion. But I'm a little concerned that a lot of this is taking our eye off the ball when it comes to China. 
because the issues in Hong Kong are still very, very much alive. And the Johnson administration absolutely needs to be assertive on this. I've been encouraged to have been taking a bit more of a hard line recently in terms of um, trying to go ahead if um, if Xi Jinping's regime continues to violate the economy of Hong Kong. One country two systems is effectively dead. Not only have they betrayed the Hong Kongers, but um, they've also torn up an internationally binding um, declaration, the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984. Um, so that's an insult to this country as well. Um, you see, human rights is an extremely important issue, but this isn't just about human rights. It's actually about our domestic sovereignty as well. So those who say, oh, it's, you know, it's a different culture, let them, you know, I think it's a phony excuse. But even if you want to ignore the human rights issue, the fact that they have up to a million people, probably more, incarcerated in concentration camps in Xinjiang, the fact that there is basically no right to dissent in mainland China against the communist regime, the fact that they so cardly, in such a cardly way, hide from their own history, all these things, to me, really should rebuke this notion that we should have any sort of sense of guilt when it comes to China. Because this is what the Chinese regime will do. They will try their best to push the colonial European narrative or the colonial Western narrative. We need to say, no, we're not going to accept this. We see what you're doing. We know what your record is, and we're not going to take insults. In my opinion, one of the biggest problems with the West in recent years, or particularly Western Europe, is um, this very naive notion that if we just kind of go softly, softly with China, they'll, they'll reform internally. I think Kevin Rudd was right in his assessment about this. It hasn't happened. All that's happened is China under Xi Jinping is growing more powerful, more assertive, um, and more arrogant. Um, we really, really, really need to take this seriously because they already have a serious foothold in the World Health Organization. We've seen that with the sort of pathetic way that the World Health Organization has praised China, despite their cover up of COVID-19. But, um, you know, they're going to try and infiltrate the Internet itself. Um, so we might even find a situation that in the near future, we could even find sensitive articles about China censored in Western countries because the Chinese government will get a foothold into the World Wide Web more and more and more. Um, we need to absolutely, absolutely be wary about things like that. Um, I mean, the situation with the two Canadians, it's a difficult situation for Ottawa because, of course, if they take too much of a hard line, then these men could just be they're clearly being held hostage. You know, if the Chinese state is so convinced they're guilty, give them a trial. Put them on trial. Look at the evidence. Why aren't they doing that? It seems to me they're holding them hostage because um, Meng Wanzhou is facing trial in Canada. So basically, it's just petty revenge. Um, even though she is having her full due process. Incidentally, she has the freedom of the city of Vancouver. She lives in a luxury apartment. Contrast to the squalor that these two Canadian nationals are probably living in, in a Chinese prison cell. Summed up, I think that we, we need to stop sitting on the fence. I think we need to take a much harder line. We need to recognise what the Chinese state is doing and we need to stand up to them. It's as simple as that. And I think for the most part, we haven't done so. It isn't just about the government, though. It's also Western institutions. I'm disgusted, to be quite honest, with Western universities taking millions of um, pounds for our Chinese investment. And they've actively turned a blind eye to some of the things that have been going on. When the University of Sheffield was told about the sort of intimidation by mainland students, their response was to give a generic sort of memo to say to students oh look you need to respect each other don't don't engage in bullying we take this seriously not a single mainland student has been suspended i want to know why not not suspended not expelled despite the evidence not one 
I can't help thinking, is it because they don't want to upset the Chinese embassy or their Chinese investors? If that is the truth, and who knows, but if that is the case, that is utterly pathetic. Our position should be, uh, Chinese students should be welcome to study here. You know, they pay a lot of money. Uh, they come for the studies, take in the social life, take in the cultural life. But if they start acting as fifth columnists, if they start promoting the Chinese nationalist agenda, technically they may have a right to engage in protest and wave their flags, but that should be seen as an insult to the host nation. You know, if you have a foreign national coming to this country, waving their flag around and demanding respect, that in itself is disrespectful. I mean, just imagine for a second a group of Britons going to China and standing outside the Xinhua headquarters and demanding that, you know, respect for the UK. It wouldn't happen because it's impossible. It wouldn't be allowed. So I think these students need to be called out for their hypocrisy. And I think if they engage in violence or intimidation, they need to be expelled, as any other student would be. We just need to take a much harder line. And that is not xenophobia. It's not about collectively attacking all Chinese people. I have no problem with ordinary Chinese people who come to Western countries as tourists, as legitimate business people, or as students who just want to study. And by the way, I don't, I wouldn't support any such move that would like collectively ban all mainland Chinese. I think that would be wrong. Um, but I do think we need to be assertive, and I do think we need to say, look, um, you're welcome here but we will not tolerate any attempts to undermine us. You need to respect the host nation, simple as that. Because you can be absolutely sure the Westerners who behave badly in China would not be tolerated. Put simply, I think Western tolerance can go too far. But what affects Canada, what affects Australia, also affects the UK and France and the Netherlands. We need to really, really see what's going on here. China is not an ally. China is not our friends. I'm talking about the Chinese state. We can respect the country as one of the world's great civilizations, but we should not bow to these arrogant demands of undeserved respect. China doesn't deserve respect right now, not until it starts abiding by international laws, particularly regarding Hong Kong. Um, it's a matter of our national honor, actually, to do the right thing with this. And I am heartened to see Johnson and Rob are finally starting to take a more assertive line. But I think they could go further. I think the Huawei deal can be totally scrapped. I think uh, CGTN needs to lose its license. Uh, Ofcom has given some vague warnings. They haven't done anywhere near enough. I think universities need to be heavily scrutinised. I would support, for example, a policy that fined universities if they fail to stand up to Chinese infiltration. I would... If I was the Department of Education, I would be threatening them with fines. Because it's very clear that some of these departments in major British universities are basically relying on Chinese investment. That is dangerous because as soon as you start relying on China, it makes it harder to criticise them. So we need to get assertive and in my view, we need to take a harder line. Certainly not tolerate their insults. 